Uh, one more comment about uh, Adrian Peterson here. Um, he is very interesting in that he has a lot of rushes that are either zero or negative yards. Uh, in fact, in that year, 2012, when he did so well, it was about 25% of his rushes were zero or negative yards. The thing that made him get so many yards was he had so many really long runs. Um, here's, again, simulated seasons. You can basically, the way he was going here, you can expect, well, that's a lot of them. You can expect it looks like maybe <coughs> 10 to 15 really long rushes in a given season. Okay, and that's why he ended up with so many yards, and that's why his yardage was so high. And this, this happens all the time with him. It happened last week. He played Detroit. And, like, if you watch that game, like, 50% of his rushes were, like, zero or negative yards. And some other ones were only, like, one or two yards. And then he pops off the 75 yard. Okay, and that got his average from, like, 1.5 yards per rush up to close to five yards per rush. So it's just weird how that happens. But that's kind of uh, seemingly his nature. All right, uh, so for the rest of today, um, we are going to go again talk more about confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. Uh, first off, here in lecture B, we're going to use confidence intervals for two tailed tests, talk about how to do that. So I can find the slide here. Here we go. Test of significance, again, that's just another name for a hypothesis test. And confidence intervals. A level alpha two-sided significant te significance test rejects a hypothesis, a null hypothesis, mu equals mu sub zero. This is some fixed number, but they're leaving it unspecified. So when you read something like this, you're just going to imagine it's something specific like 10 or something. Exactly when the value mu sub zero, this number over here, this fixed number, falls outside a 1 minus alpha confidence interval for mu. Kind of a strange statement. What does it mean? Let's do an example here. I'll come back to the statement. Let's look at the example. Um, okay, let's do a, a, the housing example here. <clears throat> so this was the example from last time where it was a two-sided test. We did a similar example that was one-sided. If you remember the one-sided one, the realtor had a theory that people in Minneapolis spent less than the national average on housing. Mm -hmm. And in this twisted one, the twist on the housing example, we're pretending the realtor doesn't know, has no idea whether people in Minneapolis spend more or less on housing. And therefore, because of that, it was a two-sided test. The null hypothesis is that the spending in Minneapolis was the same as the national average, 33%. And the alternative hypothesis is that it was not 33%. It was a two-sided thing. And I, I talked about calculating the p-value. Initially, by thinking about it as the sum of two areas, and then saying by symmetry, we can just take one of the areas and double them, multiply the one-tailed p-value by two. Let's now decide whether to reject the null hypothesis here or not based on a confidence interval. x bar plus or minus z star times sigma over square root of m. What's the sample mean? 30.8%. And usually we think of percentages as, as being proportions, but for the purpose of this problem, we're thinking of it as being a mean. And that can be okay. I mean, every state spends a certain percentage on housing, and you can average them. Plus or minus, what's Z star? Well, you've got to look at the confidence level. How do you decide the confidence level? It's not in the way the problem stated. I think what I did last time was when I did this with uh, calculating the p-value, I went ahead and used the most common level of significance, 5%. Remember that? Let's go ahead and use alpha equals 
Again, what is that? It's called the level of significance. What does it mean? It's, it's setting the standard of evidence you're going to need before you're going to reject the null hypothesis. The lower alpha is, the higher the standard you need. You reject the null when the p-value is less than alpha. Okay? This is your standard of very small, 5% or less here for us. So we'll use that. Um, that's going to mean z star is 1.96. We've seen that before. Plug that in for z star, 1.96. Don't attach a percent to that. That doesn't have any units. Sigma, that's 9.2% up there. 9.2%. We're going ahead and pretending that's right. It's the population standard deviation we're pretending, and we're going to go ahead and pretend it's the population standard deviation just for households of Minneapolis. What's the sample size? It's 50. Let's go ahead and recalculate this. I think we did this example. I mean, I, I know we considered this example. I guess we didn't do it necessarily as a confidence interval before. 9.2 divided by square root of 50. 1.3. That's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Multiply that by 1.96 get 2.55 for our margin of error. And that would be in percent, 2.55%. So our confidence interval in plus or minus notation is 30.8%, plus or minus 2.55%. Technically, they should be rounded to the same precision. But I kind of just like doing one more decimal place of accuracy with my margin of error. This is going to lead to an interval notation, an interval that goes from 30.8% minus 2.55% to 30.8% plus 2.55%. And instead of putting percents in all those spots, I think I'll just put a percent at the end there. And that's okay if you do that too. 30.8 minus 2.55 is 28.25. And 30.8 plus 2.55 is what? 33.35%. What's the purpose besides just calculating the interval? The, the purpose was to decide do we reject the null or not? What did that slide that I showed you before say? It says we're going to reject the null we're going to reject the null for a two-sided test exactly when the null value falls outside the confidence interval. Alpha is 5% or 0 0.05, 1 minus alpha is 0.95, 95% confidence interval, that's what we calculate here. The null value, mu sub 0, is 33% here. That's inside this interval, so we do not reject the null. That's the conclusion. Should make intuitive sense. When you do the test, you give the null the benefit of the doubt. You assume it's true until proven otherwise. Now, that assumption may be faulty, but it is the way it's done. You assume the null is true until proven otherwise. So we are assuming mu is, mu is 33%. We got a confidence interval that includes 33%. And so intuitively, that should mean, oh, yeah, we don't have much evidence against the null, because the null value is inside the interval. If, on the other hand, our interval only went up to 32.35%, then this would not be in the interval if that were the case. And that would mean we would reject the null. OK, so you can use confidence intervals for two-sided significance tests. I'll remind you I said some people always do two-sided tests, just as a matter of philosophy, of always doubling their one-tailed p-value, at least for these kinds of tests, and therefore getting a higher p-value than they would otherwise, and therefore making it harder to get the p-value below alpha, 
therefore making it harder to reject the null. You're going to need really strong evidence against the null before you're going to reject. That philosophy of giving the null the benefit of the doubt is so strong that many people always do two-tailed tests. Please stop me if you've got a question. Okay? There are lots of, lots of terms, lots of concepts, lots of subtleties that are all important. You've got to pay attention to. All right, more subtleties, more information. It's good for you to hear here today, paying your best attention. Maybe write some things down. It's good for you to read about. More subtleties, details here that are important in actually applying these ideas. There's sort of two approaches to take in doing hypothesis testing, tests of significance. One approach, which is our book's approach, is to emphasize p-values, maybe even more so than even saying anything for alpha the level of significance. Maybe you don't even, and that comes up in the book's problems. Sometimes they don't even tell you what to use for alpha, which I said you could, for the moment, use 5% if you wanted to, if the book doesn't tell you otherwise. However, in practice, in real life, you've got to decide alpha or do something else. Our book takes the philosophy that the p-value is more important not just for your decision, but also maybe for other people's decisions. And maybe you come to a group decision based on different people even having different opinions about the p-value. Again, the smaller the p-value, the greater the strength against the null, leading you to be more likely to reject the null. But sometimes it's still a group decision. Sometimes there are external things that need to be considered. Like, if the null is false and we reject it, what does that mean practically? And you know, about our company, or we're going to have to purchase some new equipment, for example, because the old equipment is faulty. This affects decisions and affects other things, and time and money do still affect the decision about whether to reject the null or not. The p-value approach to focus on that and focus on sort of a group decision about things uh, is sort of a more modern approach to things. The alpha, the level of significance approach, is more of an old school approach that people thought of when they first were talking about doing hypothesis testing, which is basically in the past 100 years, by the way. You know, a lot of math you do is like 500 to 2,000 years old. But statistics, as the subject is that we teach right now, is only about 100 years old. Okay? Choosing alpha first, with, that's the old approach, does seem to have a level of honesty and does make things simpler in that you can just decide to reject or not based on just what z is. You don't have to figure out a p-value. You don't have to figure out a probability. So it's a little simpler in that way, though it does give you less information. It also can seem more honest. You are deciding beforehand what alpha is, meaning you are deciding what level of evidence you're going to require before you're going to reject. And for example, if you're doing a one-tailed test, let's pick at something different for alpha besides 5%. If you're doing, say, a right-tailed test, and you decide to pick alpha to be 0.01, 1%, you can decide what values of z will lead to rejecting the null without having to figure out a p-value. You can just use a table. Table A, in fact. How? Well, it's a right tail test. Alpha is 0.01. Since it's a right tail test, you are going to reject when you are considering areas to the right of numbers. You'd like to figure out what value of z, I'll put z equals question mark, makes this area equal to alpha for a right-tailed test. In table A, that means you'd go and you'd look for an area to the left being 1 minus 0 0.01, 0 0.99. 
Where, what area is closest to 0.99? I know this is hard for you guys to see. Turns out to be right there. That's a 0.9901. That corresponds to Z is 2.33. So if you are doing a right tail test and you decide alpha is going to be 1%, that's a very low alpha, you're going to require strong evidence against the null before you reject it, that's going to lead to a boundary Z statistic. Sometimes you might call this Z sub crit for critical Z. Maybe I'll even put the word critical. It's the boundary value of Z that's going to lead to rejecting the null of 2.33. In other words, you're going to reject the null for a right tail test if the Z stat you calculate is bigger than 2.33. Calculated Z is calculated with this formula. Take the sample mean, the x bar that you got, subtract the null value, divide by sigma over square root of n. That's the calculated z. You reject the null for this right tail test when z is greater than or equal to z crit. Critical when z is greater than or equal to 2.33. So the point I'm trying to make here, once again, is what I made a few minutes ago. You could do a hypothesis test, say a right tail test, with a certain level of significance, and you could decide whether to reject the null or not without ever figuring out the p-value. That could be done. Once you've done this work to figure out the critical value for a right tail test based on a 1% level of significance. If, by the way, if this were a left tail test and the same alpha, then you'd think about the corresponding z over here that would lead to an area equal to alpha. If it's a left tail test, you've got to look at a left tail. And by symmetry, the answer would be negative 2.33. And therefore, if your z stat that you calculate is to the left of negative 2.33, less than it, then you would reject for a left tail. For a two-tailed test, and the same alpha, well, now it's trickier. A two-tailed test, you want each one of these areas to be alpha over 2, because you want them to add to alpha. You want this to be alpha over 2, and this to be alpha over 2, which in this case would be 0.005 mean that in table A, you need to look for 1 minus 0 0.005, 0 0.995. It's halfway between those two numbers. This is a 0.9949, and this is a 0 0.9951. 0 0.9949 corresponds to 2.57. corresponds to 2.58. I'd be fine with you using either one of those or splitting the difference, averaging them. 2.575 is probably the closest you can do. So the critical values in this case for a two-tailed test are plus or minus 2.575 is what I said, I think. 2.575, yeah. And you're going to reject the null for a two-tailed test if z is greater than or equal to 2.575 or less than or equal to negative 2.575 for a two-tailed test at a 1% level of significance. You know I'm talking theoretical here. You ever imagine that you could do the, the example? You'd have to calculate x bar, know the null value, be given sigma, no n, figure out this number. If this were the test you're doing, you'd then compare. Is the number bigger than or equal to 2.575 or less than or equal to negative 2.575? If it is, you would reject the null at the 1% level of significance. You'd say it's statistically significant at the 1% level. Again, this is without a p-value. 
But again, you should be able to calculate a p-value too. Even when you have an alpha. And you would reject the null if the p-value is less than alpha. And fail to reject if it's greater than alpha. Though there are some subtle things you should consider there as well. Like what if it's really close to alpha? Should you really reject if it's just barely below alpha? And fail to reject if it's just barely above alpha? Not necessarily. You've got to take other things into consideration in real life. Time and money. Or maybe, maybe if you make the wrong decision, people are going to die even. I'm serious. You're not making a joke there. Or more people will die if you make a wrong decision than if you make a right decision. It's, it's not all cut and dried in real life. And you should consider those things as you think about problems. You should not just do math without thought, okay? You should think about the context and what your decisions mean. P-value provides more information. The p-value indicates how close we are to various significance levels that would lead to rejection or not. For example, a p-value of 0 0.02566, which is a number I made up, would indicate that we reject the null, for example, if alpha is 5% and fail to reject the null or accept the null, you could say, if alpha is 1%. Actually, I usually prefer people saying I fail to reject the null. That's the more typical way to look at it. Typically, uh, you are a researcher maybe hoping to prove your hypothesis, which is the alternative hypothesis. This is not always the case, but it's often the case. And therefore, you're kind of hoping you can reject the null, maybe so you get funding Maybe so your department gets funding in some company. All right. Um, where was I going with that? I forgot where I was going with that. There was some reason I was bringing it up, but it, it, it's escaping me now. Anyway, coming back here. If you decided alpha was 5%, you would reject the null with that p-value. If you had decided beforehand that alpha is 1%, you would fail to reject. Oh yeah, you're like the, you're trying to, you're hoping the null is wrong. So you don't typically say, I accept the null. You say, oh, I failed to reject it. It's not that I believe the null, I just don't have enough evidence against it. You do give it the benefit of the doubt. It's like a courtroom. The null hypothesis is the assumption of innocence. The alternative hypothesis is they're guilty. And you're like the prosecuting attorney. You don't think they're innocent, but maybe you don't have enough evidence that they are not innocent. Some evidence, just not strong evidence. How small must the p-value be before we decide to reject the null? In the old school style of thinking, we reject, the p reject when the p-value is less than alpha. But that just rephrases the question, what should alpha be? This 5% is really arbitrary. Why not 4%? Why not 3%? Why not 6%? Why not 7%? It's really an arbitrary thing. 1%, that's arbitrary too. They're all arbitrary. How do you decide? Again, in real life, it's not like the book. They don't just tell you, use this for alpha. You have to decide. So even though you might use a preset alpha, what alpha should you pick? The textbook answer is to consider two issues. If the null is believed to be true by lots of people, you're only going to convince them if you use a really small alpha, if you get a really small p-value. And they also know you did good sampling design. Okay, we don't want bias samples. Then all this stuff is out the window. If bias samples, it's all out the window. It doesn't mean a thing. Okay, you want simple random sampling at least to apply this math in the most ideal way, even though that's not always practical. If the consequences of rejecting the null are severe, then we want strong evidence. If people are going to die if you reject the null when it's true, that would be bad. When could that happen? Maybe you're testing a auto safety feature, a part that helps your car be safer. Is it really safer than the old part? If you think it is, but it's not, more people will die than if it than if it was better. You think it's better, but it's not. So you go ahead with production, but just as many people are as dying as before, or maybe even worse. Using a predetermined
indeterminate level of significance, an alpha is not always a good idea. Again, because maybe you want some flexibility in your decision making. It does seem more honest, but you might still want some flexibility with time, money, and safety issues coming into play. You want to use, you want to use common sense. Okay, a lot of critical thinking, I claim is common sense, is really thinking carefully about the situation. And that takes effort. But once you think carefully about the situation, use common sense. Are people going to die? Or is this going to save us money? Is it going to be worth it? Those kinds of things should be thought about. Here's some additional advice. Examine the data before applying the test. Look for outliers. Look for patterns, trends, time trends. Like Adrian Peterson over time did better as the season went on. You, if you're just looking at a histogram, you've lost the time effects. Maybe there are time effects that you're ignoring. <clears throat> After the test, see if the conclusion on the graph tell the same story. If they don't, then you might have made a mistake somewhere. Or maybe the outliers are affecting things more than you might want. It's uh, advice of the textbook to consider confidence intervals before doing tests. And as I noted a minute ago, a poorly designed statistical experiment <coughs> produce meaningless results. You can do all the calculations that they want, you want, it doesn't mean anything. That can be misleading and can lead to wrong decisions, definitely bad decisions, could lead to you being fired, okay, which makes you want to really tread carefully with statistics. You want to not just do the statistics and thinking about the statistics on your own. You want to talk to your colleagues in the workplace and make sure they agree with you about things, going in on things together. All right, our last few minutes, I'm just going to introduce a couple new topics. These new topics are just as hard, if not harder, than what we've done already. We're just going to introduce them. This is content from section 6.4. <clears throat> Make sure you read this section before class next time. There's something about the power of a statistical test. That is a probability. Power, that sounds like a good word, right? I've got a lot of power. That sounds good. And power of a test is a good thing. You want high power. You want to be able to, your test to be able to show something. In this case, you want your test to be able to prove or have strong evidence against the null if the null really is false. You want to be able to reject the null if the null is really false. The power of a test is the probability of correctly doing that, correctly rejecting the null accepting the alternative when the null is in fact false. With the caveat, in order to actually do the calculation, you have to assume a particular alternative value. You have to pick some particular value of mu, for example, to actually do the calculation. Which brings up a question, how do you decide what value of mu you should pick to do the calculation? And there are guidelines which we'll talk about next time. That's called the power of a test, and that's a new concept that is a challenge for people. One more slide that is also a challenge for people and is somewhat related to this are what are type 1 and two type, type 2 errors? If we reject the null, when in fact we should not have because the null is true, that's an error. It's not a math error, it's an error in your decision. You've done something you shouldn't have. You rejected the null when you shouldn't have because it's true. And a type 2 error is the opposite. Fail to reject the null when it's false. You should have rejected it. In a courtroom, a type 1 error is like convicting an innocent person. Rejecting the null hypothesis that they're innocent when you, sh when you should not have because they're innocent. And a type 2 error is like failing to convict a guilty person. Failing to reject the null when you should have, because it's false. Turns out the probability of a type 1 error is equal to alpha, the significance level, and the probability of a type 2 error is equal to 1 minus the power. So that's my little introduction to those things. Make sure you study section 6.4 well before class. Okay.